Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I'm delighted to uh, begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather today is the traditional unceded territory of the Silk Okanagan Nation and their people. I also want to acknowledge that many of you are joining us from both near and far. And I want to also recognize the traditional owners of those lands as well. So my name is Joan Batorf and I'm director of the Institute for Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention. And I'm really delighted to host this webinar today um, in partnership with uh, a research cluster that is associated with our institute. So we're hosting this particular webinar in, in um, at the same time and as part of the BC Cultural Days, which has been happening since September 25th and goes on till October 25th. And it's interesting that the theme for this year's event, for the 220 event, was unexpected intersections. And this theme was chosen to encourage creative thinking, uh, new avenues of discovery, and new collaborations. And I can't think of a better way to acknowledge this theme than by our presentation today. So we're really delighted to have uh, representatives from the UBCO Research Cluster in Cl Culture, Creativity, Health, and Well-Being today. This group was one of the groups funded through the UBC Eminence Research Cluster Award. And we're delighted to have several members of the group here today. Not everybody, but we have a very good representation. And um, I'm going to have them introduce the whole team that's with you here today. But I want to acknowledge the leaders of this team who are with us joining us today. Uh, Karen Raigunandin, from a professor of teaching in the Okanagan School of Education at UBC Okanagan, and Virginia Manha, associate professor in creative and critical studies here at UBC Okanagan. And they're gonna share some of what they've been up to. So I'm going to turn it over to Karen and Virginia to introduce the rest of the group and uh, to present their work to us today. And there should be time for questions and comments at the end. So I encourage you to think about those and you can add them to the chat box and we'll be delighted to read them out to our speakers. So Karen and Virginia, uh, Virginia, I'll turn it over to you, thanks. Thank you very much, Joan. Uh, Liz, do you mind putting up our poster as I uh, start introducing ourselves? So good morning, everyone. It is such a pleasure for um, myself and my colleagues from our research cluster to be here today and sharing our, our work with you. So as Joan said, my name is Karen Ragunata, and I'd like to, um, and so welcome to our session, Being Creative for Health and Wellbeing. I'd also like to introduce Liz Sable. Liz, quick wave. There she is. And Liz is the project coordinator and our, also our graduate research student on this project. And she's also the designer of this project, of the poster that you're seeing here. So I just wanted to recognize Liz for, for her work in this regards. So this poster um, is really representative of our collective work as all of us in different places, in different regions, in different countries, explored creativity, culture, health, and well-being. Um, you may not be able to see it from the poster, but we are truly a collective of artists, of practitioners, of researchers, in humanities, in education, in health, in performing arts and social sciences. And we gather together to think about artistic, musical, theatrical, voice, performance, and mindfulness practices and their impact on cultural, spiritual, environmental dimensions of health and well being. Our cluster members are based in the UK, they're based in France, they're based in Canada, and we all came together to implement an arts-based and community-engaged research projects, but also practical projects whose aim was really to promote, to enhance, and to sustain health and well-being. We also really wanted to focus on multiple ways of knowing, of being, of doing, and specifically looking at expressions of well-being and health that sort of veered away from traditional practices which were focused on nutrition and on physical activity. 
So as Joan mentioned, we are a large group, um, but there are three of us here today who will be talking about our, our individual projects. Uh, so Virginie Magna will be speaking. Uh, so we met Virginie. Tanya Williard, uh, just a quick little wave, Tanya. So Tanya will be speaking after Virginie, and then I'll be presenting a little bit of my work. So we'll all be talking for around 10 minutes or so. As Joan said, we would love to interact and, and take your questions afterwards, and we should have time uh, for that afterwards. I also want to mention, I think that one of our project members, Rena Sharon, may be joining us. So Rena, if you are here with us today, we would love to hear from you during the Q&A session as well. Um, so now on to uh, Virginie. Oh, Virginie, your mic. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yes, I, I'm unmuted now. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Karen, for the introduction. Um, and thank you, Liz, for um, putting up our, our Weebly site that you can see right now. Um, I would really like to invite you to visit it at your own pace and your own time. Uh, it's, uh, we, we're launching it today officially, so we're really happy uh, to uh, be able to share the different projects that we've documented in our Weebly. This is my page, but everyone has a page. We also have a page for um, our homepage presenting everyone. So if you want to know more about the cluster members, uh, there's quite a bit of information about their work and their contribution to our cluster. Um, so today I would like to, um, I would like to, um, uh, sorry, I've got to, um, get out of this so I can see what I want to present to the exit full screen. Okay, so I would like to talk about, um, you know, uh, give you a little bit of an idea of what's at stake for a cluster. And, and what I'm going to talk about today is based on a call for a paper actually that I created with another cluster member, Nathalie Gotta, for a special issue we're going to uh, uh, co-edit for a UK-based um, scholarly journal. So I wanted to share with you some of the most up-to-date questions um, that our cluster is investigating and engaging with so that we can engage you with those questions and um, we can have an interesting uh, exchange today. So what I think is at stake today um, is the relevance of cultural and artistic creativity in response to the current health crisis caused by the global pandemic. Remember, for example, images of Italian people singing with and for each other from their balcony. I also think it's becoming clear that there is a link between this health crisis and the environmental crisis that we are experiencing. And um, perhaps, and that's something that I, I'm, I'm kind of proposing as a question or a possibility, um, perhaps um, what, what a cultural practice uh, can do, one of the most radical things that cultural practice can do, as in the example of Italian people singing on their balcony, is to challenge neoliberal conceptions of creativity, considered to be the hallmark of capitalist productivity, adaptability, and efficacy. So how can we revitalize, renew, and reimagine creativity in relation to the notion of well-being broadly conceived? And as you will see, we conceive of, of well-being in, in many different ways, and not just as Karen was saying, as um, you know, not having a, a, a disease or being sick, but much more broadly. Our cluster's mandate is to collaborate with scholar practitioners, artists, educators, and activists who critically and reflexively investigate um, the cultural, social, political, ecological, and spiritual dimensions of well-being. In response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action addressed to researchers and educators and in accordance with the UBC Indigenous Strategic Plan 2020, we are committed to honoring the perspectives of Indigenous scholars and artists and we seek to develop decolonizing approaches to arts-based pedagogy that can contribute to the health and well-being of culturally diverse communities. Um, so um, I want to uh, provide a few examples of uh, what's happening now uh, in research, uh, some of the questions that come up uh, and that our cluster is engaged with. So I want to speak of uh, just uh, the work of a colleague, Magda Kazubowski, Houston, an anthropologist and performance studies scholar at York University, who's uh, um, in, in the midst of publishing a new book called In Search of Lost Futures that's forthcoming in early 2021. And in this book, she writes in the introduction, 
Quote, today, in the age of COVID-19, politicians, scientists, and the media are telling us that the future of this world lies in our own individual hands, and that by taking appropriate measures of social distancing and staying at home, we can divert the tide of uh, the pandemic. She uh, then provides a counter perspective by referring to anthropologist Arjun Apadurai's view that, quote, individuals can improve their well being by strengthening their collective capacity to aspire, end quote. So, one of the questions that comes out of this example is how can cultural and artistic creativity to enhance individual well-being while developing our collective capacity to aspire to a future which is uh, in which social justice, cultural diversity and inclusivity lead to building healthier communities. Um, Tanya Willard is going to speak about the projects she developed in collaboration with indigenous artists and communities. Community. I'd like to point out that in this report, Linda Archibald outlines three interconnected models, um, creative arts as healing, creative arts in therapy, and quote, a holistic approach to healing that includes creative arts, culture, and spirituality, an indigenous model that encompasses culture, language, history, spirituality, traditional knowledge, art, drumming, singing, dance, and storytelling, a comprehensive, holistic approach aimed at restoring balance, end quote. So one of the questions we're looking at is So I do believe that Virginie has been cut off. Um, she was having a, well, we'll just wait a couple of minutes for her to come back. Virginie, are you there? I'm thinking that her, Virginie, can you hear me? I think her, I noticed her screen is frozen. Um, and she's not showing any audio right at the moment. She's either. not. So, no. oh, here she is. Can you hear me now? Virginie, yeah, you cut off for uh, a little bit. Are you, are you, can you hear us? Yeah. I see you. Okay, go ahead. You're good. Okay. So uh, yeah, I was saying that uh, Karen is going to talk about mindfulness practice, which is rooted in Buddhism. And as an experimental theater practitioner trained in movement-based improvisation, I'm interested in the connection between mindfulness and this type of performance training. So for example, American dancer, performance artist, improviser, and educator, Barbara Dilley, a member of the groundbreaking dance and performance ensemble, the Grand Union, that really explored uh, movement improvisation explains that contemplative dance practice informed by Buddhism prioritizes self-care, personal awareness, kinesthetic delight, so the delight of being aware of one's movement in space, and creating an open space that fosters non-judgmental forms of exploration. Dilly suggests that contemplative dance contemplative dance practice can be conducive to a, can be conducive, sorry, to moments of what she calls egolessness, so letting go of, one ego, of one's ego, where relationship to environment becomes the source of movement improvisation. Um, speaking about her experience of these moments, she states, I'm a wave, I'm fluid, not fixed. A wave is an energy form that is without a center. So one of the questions that comes up for me from this connection between mindfulness and performance is, how can cultural and artistic practices foster self-care and egolessness prioritize non-judgmental process of a product and produce kinesthetic delight while simultaneously decentering and reconfiguring Western creativity that are anthropocentric, that is to say human focused and human centered. Um, this is an ongoing debate in the humanities today, um, this idea of anthropocentrism and how can creativity help us to uh, be connected to our environment uh, in a way that is uh, less human focused, but focused on the health of the planet, which of course is connected to our own health. How am I doing, how am I doing with time uh, in terms of uh, my presentation? Uh, am I out of time because I was, uh, okay, so I will continue a little bit. 
So in contemplative and transformative education, some researchers foreground the current emphasis on contemplative practices um, as means for individual stress reduction, devoid of attention to the social service and social transformation dimension. To address this imbalance, these researchers argue that it is crucial to identify global possibilities of solidarity that require destabilizing Eurocentric attachments to notions of autonomy and sovereignty of the self or the ego, and uh, fostering instead notions of interconnectedness and interdependency to our environment, to each other, that preclude imposing one's values upon others in the name of a global ethics that perpetuates the mindset behind colonialism. So we can ask how can contemplative cultural and artistic practices, including mindfulness practices, foster well-being in ways that are mindful of social service and social transformation. And finally, uh, you know, in the uh, pre-COVID-19 uh, era, some performance studies scholars, Anne Harris and Stacey Holman Jones in 2018, so fairly recently, explored the connection between creativity, the performing arts and community in a discussion that now sounds uncannily, preci uncannily prescient to me, uh, um, they uh, refer to also to Apadurai by contrasting neoliberalism's nearly ubiquitous discourse on creativity as entrepreneurship and innovation with Apadurai's notion of social imaginary, which they argue offers a different role for creativity, one that is intimate, transmitted through sociality rather than capital, enabling the creation of newly imagined communities. They provide the example of the performing arts, which return us to the body and remind us of the importance of touch and connection and the political possibilities that develop from a ground up person to person and body to body. They hypothesize that the yearning for connection that we have, um, that it is expressed through performing arts might stem from our need to create contact and a sense of community with others, a mechanism for forming a rapid response community, a network of people to whom we can turn in moments of need and crisis. So my last question is, what types of cultural and artistic practices might be conducive to the creation of newly imagined communities to which we can turn in these challenging times? Thank you very much, Virginie. Um, Tanya, on to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really uh, grateful to have been invited to this eminence cluster by uh, Virginie and Karen. White, Kofaita, Prisquest Tanya Willard, Laka, Kla, Loeka, the Nesconlis, Ne Sopamuk Utlu. Uh, so I introduce myself in my language as Virginie points to the links between cultural resurgence and resilience and community health uh, and outcomes are, are really strongly linked in Indigenous communities and I, I base my work uh, in this kind of realm. Uh, I was invited to this cluster and I work as an, as an artist. Um, I'm coming to you today from uh, to come Loops in the Sopatmuk territories, so um, to say hello from my home territory. And this has been intentional in my work to shift uh, outside of Western uh, forms of aesthetics and gallery systems, uh, not to, um, to, uh, to terminate those relationships, but to continue them and enriching them through uh, Indigenous knowledge, um, which looks at, uh, in my work, which looks at the possibilities of a gallery led from uh, Indigenous aesthetics, or uh, as I've been um, interested in Walter Mignolo and Rolando Vasquez's idea of decolonial aesthesis, a kind of aesthetic uh, experience that is often through culture and language and embodied uh, emplacement within Indigenous territories or in relation to them. And so my work has been based in this way. I have a project called Bush Gallery, which recognizes that uh, the bush or the land is sort of the uh, consistent with Indigenous ideas of what a gallery could be. So that perhaps that if the 1951 um, a report on Canadian cultural policy had included uh, Indigenous concepts, we may have a very different system in Canada for culture. But as it was, that uh, commission, the Massey-Levesque report, uh, if you look at the chapter, this 
paragraphs on Indigenous art. Uh, they are consistent with a salvage kind of anthropology, an idea of extinction, uh, and that our ways uh, as artists were being sort of polluted by our colonial arts. So this idea that we were trapped in the past and that's how our art should operate. So I work as a contemporary artist and I contest that in my work. I constantly look at a continuum of practice that acknowledges my land and my ancestors and the importance of, uh, as this eminence cluster points to, the importance of interdisciplinarity, uh, interconnection, uh, and being able to really creatively position the work that we do. And I think this is essential now in these fastly um, changing times uh, amid the pandemic that uh, creative strategies are used to look at ways that we can innovate and continue the work that we're doing. So I premise this with my work with Bush Gallery and my work as an artist and curator. And that's how I've participated in the research cluster. And I'll say I think it's the space that Karen and Virginie have made to really decenter uh, a dominant idea of, of perhaps research or academy or institution that allowed for me to participate in this way, both as an artist, um, so looking at research creation, as well as from a body of Indigenous ways of knowing. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this project, which was done in conjunction with the Toronto Art Biennial in 2019. And I have a few images. Liz, maybe if you can click on the first one. Perfect. And bring it up a little larger. Uh, so this is a project where the public were invited to gather around a beach fire. Uh, and this was in conjunction with artist Peter Morin. And we called this the, uh, excuse me one second, I'm going to forget my title. Uh, we called this a, a beach fire biennial. And so from Bush Gallery. So we were uh, intervening in a sense by leading with uh, this idea of Bush Gallery, but because we were outside of uh, my home territory where Bush Gallery normally takes place, we were looking at ideas of how do we follow um, protocols in this space in Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe uh, territories, how do we conduct ourselves in a respectful way as, as uninvited guests, you know, it's the Toronto Art Biennial, Biennial who invited us, not the local community, so how do we do that in a productive way? And these things I'll just uh, reinforce or uh, affirm what Virginia was talking about in terms of these, these uh, practices of culture, language, uh, Indigenous arts are for us a vital link to uh, community health and wellness. So even though this is expressly within the contemporary art realm, the principles uh, of what we're doing are still very much an invested in this idea of interconnection with the land, collaborative and community-based practice. And so we can switch to the next uh, image, Liz. So we gathered around this beach fire um, and we engaged in methodology, methodology, excuse me, methodologies of exchange embedded in the idea of gift economies and philosophies that are um, quite common in many Indigenous communities. So one of the first things we did is we uh, gave everybody these sweaters and the sweaters feature an image by um, Haudenosaunee artist uh, Bill Paulus. It's a very humorous uh, image of a, a, a healthy, um, jubilant uh, Mohawk man or Indigenous man. Uh, we like to call him an uncle. And he has a little umbrella hat with an eagle feather. He's sitting oceanside having this popsicle. So we're playing with this idea also of humor and joy as essential uh, to ideas of health and, uh, and also um, pointing to artists whose work has not made it into a circulation of dominant or mainstream contemporary art, uh, who nonetheless have effectively contributed a lot in art uh, to their communities. And so we gave everyone these sweaters with a Bill Paulus image, which of course we had permission from the artist uh, to use. And this was also our way of acknowledging artists from that territory. And we fed everyone from the powwow cafe. Uh, we had duck soup, we had bannock, we had wild rice. So again, this essential idea of resurgence and resilience through these through our capacities for traditional foods, language, and culture, um, but also presented in a way that was about sharing and, and gifting uh, and acknowledging where we were. And we can skip to the next slide, Liz. And so then we engaged, we also had uh, Aquasasni singers, we had presentations as it went from, uh, from the day into night. 
Now I'll also say this was October 19th and I'm not sure what I was thinking planning an outdoor event for October 19th on Toronto Island, uh, but the day was perfect and uh, we had a really amazing weather and we had a large group gathered and we, we did, um, we did a game called uh, colloquially known in our communities as Indian Bingo. You, may, you might also recognize it as a gift exchange game where uh, you start out with gifts and the gifts were important. They were canned salmon, uh, uh, toques that we had made. And so we were wanting to have this extension of gifting everybody who came. Uh, and this is how we might enact a protocol in, in visiting another Indigenous community as well. Um, though we were careful to draw the line between uh, ceremony and protocol and what we were doing as artists, that we weren't trying to cross that line, but we we're trying to work with the same philosophies and ideas within that. Um, so we, we uh, played this game of gift exchange with these gifts that we had made. We can skip to the next slide. Uh, and so we had several groups on the beach uh, gambling away, uh, working to trade these gifts uh, that they um, would acquire during the game. We can switch to the next slide. Uh, here's some of the items that were gift wrapped and, and created. We can go to the next one. And we importantly also invited Anishinaabe curator and artist uh, Lisa Myers. And she really, she works right now with a research program called Mijim, Food as Relations. And she donated the use of these um, quilts, which are uh, money bags. And we were thinking about the value of our traditional foods and things we would gift and our ways of being. Uh, and so we set all our gifts on these uh, money bag quilts uh, that Lisa Myers had made. And we asked Lisa Myers to sit with us for the duration of the project. I think, is that the last photo, Liz? Oh, okay, one more. Oh yeah, that's back at the beginning. Okay, great. So another way that, um, so this was a project uh, a year ago, a year ago. Another way we responded quite um, rapidly was uh, recently uh, an online artist residency. So called Contingencies of Care. And maybe I'll ask you, Liz, to click onto the website link for Contingencies of Care. And this was an artist residency that we responded to at this difficult uh, time uh, in the first wave of COVID in June, I believe. Uh, and we, and I'll just ask you, oh, yeah, perfect. This is the code of care um, on our site. We worked with a number of, uh, of artists, students from Ontario College of Art and Design and a really fantastic group of organizers. Uh, and we responded to uh, gathering together using different online forms to center an artist residency within this idea of care and caretaking. And this was a really powerful way for us to, um, to both um, address the self uh, and self-care within what was a difficult time. Many artists uh, had many projects that were uh, suspended or canceled um, during COVID. We all know that art galleries and museums were closed. And so this was a difficult time for many, including artists. And so we responded with this artist residency online. And the students, I wanted to point to this site, um, this page of the site, because the students uh, took up this charge uh, with the graduate research assistants with the idea of care and they put together this really beautiful code of care which were the guidelines for participating in the residency and you know they were really inclusive in that they included ideas of, um, of respecting pronouns, uh, thinking about our assumptions, thinking about what we share and the intellectual property around cultural material uh, even so complete that we had these little hubs of online participation and they left an empty chair within the circle to think about um, people who uh, are not there to speak, who don't have a voice, uh, and maybe also to point to the spiritual aspect as well. Uh, and so this was a really beautiful uh, thing that the graduate students had taken from this original proposal around ideas of care. And maybe, maybe um, Liz, if you can just uh, move to the public events part of the page. Thank you. And so we also hosted a number of uh, events. Uh, I'll just speak briefly to some that I hosted. One was a Zoom session, which I've done again recently with Nocturne Halifax, that looked at our, over, our saturation with uh, these online uh, forms. And it actually asks us in this Zoom session to turn the camera away from ourselves onto the land and to have this kind of breathing space from Zoom, but within Zoom itself. So it was sort of a catharsis to think about um, land uh, through this um, 
through this form. And this uh, came out of some of the residency activities as well, thinking about social or physical distancing as an opportunity also for earth closening. And we could just scroll down, Liz, thank you. And you'll just find a number of other projects. And uh, so one of the biggest challenges with this online residency was trying to approximate the synergies that artists have when they come together. Uh, and I was quite skeptical of this actually in the beginning because it's really important when artists come together in person uh, to create the space uh, of sharing and collaboration. And we'll just scroll up a little bit more. But you know, I was, I, was, uh, I was changed around in my viewpoint. Artists really came together in these forms uh, and we had rich uh, programming uh, that, that really is still sitting with me. And I think this idea of residency, uh, these ideas of performance and collaboration, socially engaged practice, I think have a lot to offer um, the people in the, in the field of health and thinking about how we creatively approach uh, the situations we're in and how we embed uh, a global or a broad or a holistic sense of health uh, within our communities and in particular for Indigenous communities. Um, we just are scrolling through uh, a conversation Peter Morin had with an elder around some of the protocols of the sweat lodge. Uh, and so these are the ways in which um, we're uh, responding, embedding our research within creative practice that I think have I hope um, the ability to exist within an interconnected web uh, of those of us who are um, concerned and working towards healthier futures. So thank you. Thank you very much, Tanya. I have to say, I love the idea of the land loves Zoom. <laughs> Great idea. Um, so now my turn to talk to you a little bit about the projects that I've been leading. And I'll just ask Liz to go to my, um, on our Weebly, uh, just to my page. And then I have a, PowerPoint presentation. I'm not going to go through it, you know, very formally, but just I, I love the images in the, uh, the PowerPoint and wanted to talk to you a little bit uh, about the work that I've been doing. Um, so each one of us, you know, as Tanya and as Virginie have mentioned, we are truly, um, we are a collective, we work together, but we also work, um, you know, independently um, with other, um, with other colleagues uh, across the nation, uh, you know, in different times and spaces. So in particular, I wanted to, uh, Liz, if you go down to the PowerPoint, we can, right at the bottom, we can just go ahead and click. I want to talk to you about a project uh, that I did uh, with a group of colleagues looking at holistic explorations of mindfulness. Um, so these are colleagues who came from UBC, um, who came from um, UNBC in particular. Um, we gathered together uh, within the scope of our multiple identities and our very, um, you know, uh, multitude of cultural perspectives as well. So from our settler identities, our Métis identities, uh, Maori identities as well. And what we wanted to do was look at um, mindfulness. So mindfulness within a, a truly holistic um, perspective. So looking at how mindfulness impacted the physical self. Um, the emotional self, um, um, the spiritual self, um, and also, you know, the cultural self. Um, if you go to the next, um, the next slide. Uh, so one of the things we did is we, we looked at contemplative practices and we recognize that contemplative practices are found within so many different worldviews and cultures. So whether it be Eastern, Western or Indigenous perspectives, there are certain aspects of contemplation that came and that came into play. And in particular, we tend to um, we do recognize that mindfulness uh, does come from Buddhist contemplative practices, but the art of contemplation, you know, of ceremony, of ritual, is something that is found, you know, in all of us, in all our different human cultures and ways of being and ways of doing. So uh, we looked in particular at, um, for example, because I'm in teacher education and we wanted to have a common area from which we could discuss mindfulness, we look at Ellen Langer's definition of mindfulness, so a more contemporary and secular approach to mindfulness. So before I get to the contemplative practices, I found this interesting that, you know, a psychologist talked about a mindfulness as being a flexible state of mind in which we are actively engaged in the present always noticing new things and sensitive to, con 
sensitive to context. So mindfulness, she sees it as an active search for something that is new, sort of breaking down of barriers, taking time to pause, to reflect, to look around, and then to come to maybe new ways of seeing, new ways of doing things. So that really resonated with each and every one of us, you know, in our different contexts. And we looked, uh, we understood then what she was talking about in terms of, um, you know, mindfulness is that she, she made the distinction between mindfulness and mindlessness. And she talks about mindlessness as being on automatic pilot and of simply just going through repetitive motions over and over again and not really taking the time to sort of search out, to explore, to question, to examine or to interrogate. So we came back to um, the tree of um, uh, your contemplative practices, knowing that the mindfulnesses th that we were exploring were really representative of all of our different backgrounds. And this tree of contemplative practices um, really represents, you know, how we approach mindfulness, a secular approach to mindfulness. And looking at the different branches, if you look at the roots of the tree underneath, we see that the roots of the tree, you look at communion and connection, but also awareness. And as you look at the different branches, if you make your way up the trunk, you see that each one of the different branches sort of veer off into different approaches or different aspects of practices. So whether they be stillness practices, like coming to, cal to breath, calming the breath, whether they be generative practices, so looking at nourishing the self and the spirit, whether they be creative, so artistic practices, whether it be art, uh, whether it be theater, activist, relational practice, and also movement practices. So within the scope of the tree of contemplative practices, you know, we were able to identify different ways in which we all engaged in mindfulness practices in our personal lives, but also in our professional lives as well. If you could go on to the next screen, please. So around the same time um, as we were exploring these different uh, aspects in terms of, of, of mindfulness, we also came upon the First Nations Holistic Lifelong Learning Model. And this was a model that was developed by Marie Batiste, so one of the foremost Indigenous scholars in Canada and in the world. And in 2007, Batiste um, developed um, this lifelong learning model. And if you'll notice, um, how she identified a certain sense of collective well-being where she addresses the importance of spiritual, cultural, of social, economic, of family, of ancestors. And she talks about how the importance of incorporating and interconnecting all these different aspects uh, into one's life um, is an important consideration in well-being. Another interesting facet in Batiste's work, and I had a chance to talk to her last year when we when we presented this um, on the Vancouver campus for CSSC, one of our big, um, you know, our big academic conferences, was the infusion of Indigenous and Western approaches to wellness. And she talked about the interconnectedness between the two and the importance of respecting and acknowledging um, the different ancestral wisdoms that come into play. Um, so if we could go on to the next slide. Um, so if you're interested in the First Nations Holistic Lifelong Learning Model, um, you simply have to look it up and it is available for all to see. Um, and if we could go on to the next one as well. Thank you. So how did we, you know, as um, Tanya mentioned, interdisciplinary, you know, research, uh, graduate students, community members, artists come together and focus, you know, on mindfulness? Well, we came back once again to how mindfulness was being interpreted in particular, you know, within our different professional contexts. And we came back to John Kabat-Zinn's definition of mindfulness. And he defines mindfulness as an awareness that arises by paying attention in a particular way, not non-judgmentally, um, on purpose to the present moment. And we added in uh, with kindness and curiosity. So taking time, you know, to pause, to reflect, to consider, especially as we're thinking about well-being and a holistic approach to well-being, to what is occurring in ourselves. So on a physical level, first and foremost, on an emotional level, on a, and on an intellectual level, but also on a spiritual, a cultural level as well. 
It was important we came back to Kabat-Zinn's work because uh, his work uh, came out of his own practice on Buddhist meditation and as a yoga practitioner. And for those of you who um, who may not know, Kabat-Zinn was it is is still a medical doctor, and he developed um, his concept of mindfulness around 40 years ago when he was leading um, a treatment and therapy for uh, cancer patients. And he realized that around 25% of his patients were not responding to any of the uh, pills or the, um, you know, the, the, the chemicals that were given them to help them ease, you know, into the pain of the treatments and the cancer that was in their bodies. So after a couple of years, he developed a program called MBSR, Mindfulness-Based um, Stress Reduction. And he brought in his own practices, but in a very regimented way in terms of meditation, in terms of growing awareness and mindful movement to help his student, to help his patients, his cancer patients, deal with the pain and the stress of going through the treatments. Um, he had such a success, just anecdotal success around 40 years ago that he then went on to work with um, different researchers, especially in the age, in the area of brain research and neuroplasticity, to actually research um, patients' um, brains as they were going through the different practices. And the research indicated, so through MRI and through the usual sort of very um, uh, traditional health approaches, you know, to, uh, to research, that these patients absolutely, you know, did benefit from coming, from following a 36-hour mindfulness program. And in particular, the repercussions tended to stay with them for at least six weeks or longer. So what does that mean in terms of benefits? Well, in terms of their ability to come to a place to deal with the pain, so the calmness and the receptivity, um, there was actually imagery that showed MRI imagery um, that showed the uh, thickening of the uh, prefrontal cortex, so that is the part of the brain in the front of the head that deals with self-regulation, uh, that deals with, you know, reasoning. Um, and uh, there was also a real, um, uh, the research also indicated a real sort of self-regulation in terms of emotions. So the ability to calm strong emotions as they were emerging. So in the throes of pain or stress, et cetera, recognizing what was happening, using breath to sort of, you know, assuage or to sort of calm down um, some of the feelings of fear, of stress that were emanating. So if we go on to the next slide, Liz. So essentially uh, what we have done within our different contexts at UNBC and UBC Vancouver and here in the Okanagan, we identified three types of practices that we wanted to introduce to our uh, teacher education pro uh, students um, to help them in terms of developing a sustainable approach to well-being. So we looked at calming practices, so, um, so concentration practices. Uh, we looked at insight practices um, and then we also looked at ethical practices, so making the link to the outside world. And a lot of these practices were done outdoors um, uh, in relation to the land um, and in connection to the land. So it, we, what things that we really noticed was taking our students outside of the four walls of our classrooms. Uh, here in the Okanagan campus, there's a pond area for those of you who know it, including a learning garden. There's a lovely path that goes to around the pond, up through the learning garden, into a little cluster of trees. And for just a couple of minutes it takes around 15 minutes to go you really do feel you know that you are you are in nature and that you can take the time to just sit and breathe so oftentimes we would take our students um, out around this little area it was close by it was accessible and we would simply just sit and we would um, listen uh, we would see and we would do so in silence and um, so I'm just going to talk now the next slide you know how our students came to react just a little bit um, to this oh this is just um, some of my research colleagues so this is Tina um, who is a professor at UNBC um, Tina as you can see her area is in indigenous uh, really in performance art and she was looking at uh, Maori and global knowledges and their impact on um, performance, but uh, during her work with us, she was looking at uh, mindfulness practices. Um, on to the next one, you're going to see Ross. Um, 
um, another co important component of Tina's work um, was looking at a holistic approach to wellness. So this in particular is the, an example of the pre-medicine wheel, which takes into consideration, uh, you know, the four aspects of the self um, in terms of health and well-being. Um, on to the next one, Liz, and this is Ross. Um, and Ross has written also from UNBC, Perspectives on Health um, uh, within the teachings of a gifted Cree elder. So he's worked very closely with the Cree community um, up at Prince George. And on to the next one, I think, is our student. And here we are. <laughs> Um, so um, in our teacher education program, uh, here we are beginning our year um, and we are uh, standing at the banks of um Okanagan Lake. We are in West Bank First Nation Territory and uh, this is a water ceremony uh, that was led by elders from West Bank First Nation and we begin our teacher education program um, on West Bank First Nation Territory by the beach in a water, cer water ceremony. And this is just an example of us um, as we are standing and um, yes, thinking, uh, following the directions and, and the advice of the elders um, as we are setting an intention for the year to come. Um, if we move on to the next slide. Another aspect in which we looked at mindfulness, um, not just in terms of health and well-being, but it also in terms of curricular orientation. So when our student teachers go into the schools, for example, um, a lot of them use these interventions and strategies uh, to look at, to reconsider and to restory, for example, curriculum. So to look at how to introduce omitted histories, omitted perspectives into curriculum. And in this a case in particular, uh, we are looking at the presence of the Okanagan's people within the Okanagan Valley and their uh, role and their place since time immemorial, you know, in this valley and understanding that, you know, some of the teachings in social sciences, this is a grade four, grade five classrooms, do not always take those perspectives into considerations. So bringing those in, uh, working in particular um, with uh, Indigenous uh, cultural uh, workers within the schools um, to develop, um, you know, circles of learning and more holistic approaches um, to the content, the curricular content uh, that grade five students, our teacher education students, and teachers as well are learning as we go along. And then our last slides are just going to uh, talk about the research that we did, what we learned from teacher candidates as we move forward in UNBC and at UBC Okanagan in terms of bringing mindfulness. So mindfulness, not just as a dimension of health and well-being, but also a way to interrogate, to examine society at large and to question some of the taken for granted assumptions about teaching and about learning. And some of the students, uh, these are just very brief comments from students. Um, they were uh, really more um, aware, they, they became uh, more aware of self-aware of essentially uh, what it is to be very focused and centered, learning in the moment, so taking into consideration um, the connection of the mind, body, and spirit, you know, as they were in the classrooms, as they were preparing to go into the classrooms, um, in terms of their own, um, you know, just greater awareness of their confidence as well. Um, they were also very aware of the um, importance of, um, you know, developing a greater consciousness and a greater relationality between what they were teaching, their own experiences, but also the experiences of their students in the classrooms and a greater awareness of the context in which they were in as well. And lastly, what we all learned amongst ourselves, if we go on to the next slide, uh, Liz. Um, we learned, you know, as educators, as those of us who were involved, um, you know, in this in this project about health and well-being and mindfulness, the importance of community, of place, and self, and uh, to moving forward, uh, you know, with an open heart and open mind, um, uh, with acceptance, respect, and understanding that you know, uh, part of taking time and pausing is also about questioning and interrogating and seeing ways, new ways in which we can move forward. And lastly, um, a lot of the projects that we did onto the next one, Liz, um, was funded externally. So Liz, if we just go on to the next slide. Um, Oh, maybe we don't have the next slide. Yeah, so just uh, challenges and lessons learned. So whatever, you know, we have learned um, through the course of this project, it's been going on for the last three years. Um, you know, we are, um, we, we are doing webinars, we are sharing our knowledges, um, our, our, our narratives, 
um, and our experiences uh, with one another, um, with our community, um, and with our students. And I will stop here. I can see that we have around 10 minutes left or so. Um, so I thought uh, we could just take a moment, take a pause, um, and uh, maybe see if there's any questions from the um, yeah, the panelists. Oh, and Joan, you're back on. So here. Yes, thank you. That was that was fabulous. Thank you very much. And we do invite questions and comments at this time. And we do have one uh, question from Sarah Dow Fleischner. She says, Karen, with regards to being on autopilot versus engaging in mindfulness, working with populations at various stage of trauma recovery, I found that being auto on autopilot served as an adaptive function that enabled people to survive their trauma and that mindfulness was an intense process that required a major shift in their functioning. Given the importance of mindfulness for ongoing well-being, how can mindfulness practices be scaffold, scaffolded to meet the needs of individuals at various stages of healing from trauma? And I imagine that trauma can be for, from a whole lot of things, physical trauma, but emotional trauma, trauma from illness and other, a lots, of, a lots of different forms of trauma, I expect. So what do you think about that? Well, that's a very long detailed question. And I wanna thank Sarah. Sarah is also one of our cluster members as well. And Sarah is with the, um, uh, you know, with the Faculty of Health and Social Development with specific, um, in, in the Department of in Social Work. Um, so Sarah, yes, I mean, mindfulness, you know, has become to a certain extent a panacea, you know, for all related ills. And in particular, um, there has been a lot of, um, I would say, controversy in regards to, uh, you know, to trauma. So how do we, um, for example, bring these practices, um, in particular when we're dealing with trauma? So I would say that this goes back to um, facilitation, to expertise. Um, if we go back to Kabat-Zinn's work, for example, to become a mindfulness facilitator is a very long process, so which uh, requires certifications and accreditation. So one of the things that we do tell our, our teacher uh, candidates here is while we are leading the practices for them to take these practices into schools, for example, not knowing the background of students or if they have experienced trauma is, is not recommended in any way, uh, you know, shape or form. Um, and that these practices have to be brought forward by an experienced facilitator. Mm -hmm. Great. I hope that answers your question, Sarah. <laughs> we have a couple of comments thanking um, you for this, all of you for this amazing presentation and work and um, comments about how much they enjoyed the presentation. Uh, but I have a question too. So, um, you know, some of us are not very, I speak for myself, I wouldn't consider myself an artist or very creative in terms of being artful. Um, and so I guess, Tanya, I was really impressed with some of the work that you described. And so I'm wondering how someone who, people who don't consider themselves artists, might be able to benefit from some of the activities, the artistic uh, activities and experiences that you've been able to share with us today. Um, and how that might help us, uh, you know, I guess also I'm, I'm thinking about your comments about the pandemic as well and, and how we need these activities to create interconnections and, so, and solidarity. So thinking that I might be missing out on this, I'm wondering <laughs> how I might be able to take advantage of, of some of the, the work that you and others are doing. Absolutely. Thank you, Joan. Uh, I think that the one um, thing that we've seen is that artists uh, communities and creative communities have been very quick to respond to a cha the, the changing landscape of the pandemic. And so that there's actually quite a lot of programming, uh, a majority of programming from arts and culture um, providers that actually takes place online. Uh, mm -hmm. 
you know, I think we're all having also some fatigue in those forms. So maybe like there are projects that are happening that are situated outdoors, like my project um, last year. But I think like those projects are also for publics. So they're, um, they're, you know, they're created by artists, but many artists work in this way that they're creating opportunities for engagement with the arts uh, in populations and communities. So I think there are a number of these kinds of projects uh, and it just maybe takes uh, uh, looking at the programming for your local gallery or artist run center, or given that also um, Indigenous peoples and communities are not as represented as, as other marginalized communities as well within the gallery systems, I would also look to local communities for programs that are happening uh, at community centers. I know that uh, in this area, there's a couple of uh, great artisan uh, sales, uh, you know, who knows how those are conducting um, during this pandemic. But I think if you look to your local community and then also to the galleries uh, and we also have this opportunity to connect with international projects currently. Um, uh, yeah, which is uh, exceptional opportunity for people to uh, listen to artist projects or to engage. I've even seen performance artists responding with uh, with performance that have been uh, positioned expressly for Zoom as a format. Um, so I think there's all kinds of ways that artists are are working within the current conditions to try to extend. Um, these ideas into larger communities. So I'm not sure if this exactly answers your, your question, but I encourage you, maybe I encourage you uh, to look to some of these uh, projects. For example, currently it's, um, it's Inktober, which encourages people through a set of prompts for every day of the week uh, to do a drawing. And it's just for yourself. And uh, it's a, that drawing actually also taps in, can tap into a kind of mindfulness practice, I think. Uh, and so even these little things we can do ourselves with limited uh, resources, spend some time doodling, spend some time drawing. And I think, uh, you know, it's like, it's stretching. It's stretching our muscles, but they're, they're muscles in our heart and mind maybe, yes. so. Yes, that's great. I see uh, we have one participant, Pippa, wanting uh, links to those international projects, but I'm wondering if either you could share them with Jaquetta to send out to people, or if, if you want people to contact you directly, Tanya. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I had a project that was originally envisioned um, at, for this eminence cluster, which uh, Karen and Virginie were supporting through um, some subgrants, but actually it was canceled because it was in the UK and it was a large encampment of indigenous artists uh, focused on looking at the um, 400th anniversary of the Mayflower. And that project moved online with artists responding and repositioning um, their entire projects uh, for a virtual uh, program. Um, and I'll put that uh, website in the chat, but uh, there's many, many other projects. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I can uh, list some of them, but really I think a, a Google for a city or a gallery um, or an artist run center, I really encourage people to also look at your artist run centers locally. Um, yeah. Many of those will show you all kinds of things happening. Yeah, so Pippa is joining oh. us from the Lake Country Art House, which is fabulous. Thank you for joining us. Yes. Virginia, you wanted to say something. Go ahead. I just wanted to add, uh, Joan, that uh, I think that in qualitative uh, research, in arts-based qualitative research, um, there's been this idea of democratizing the arts and cultural practice so that, you know, um, you don't have to look at yourself, uh, you don't have to think of yourself as not being an artist and that therefore not being creative. Um, I mean, that's been really criticized over many years by, you know, many different researchers working interdisciplinarily uh, across the arts and humanities because that is a Western Eurocentric kind of like, you know, elitist kind of idea. Mm -hmm. So the, I think what we're trying to, to do, and if you look at our web, Weebly and all the different things we've done with young students, with commu different communities, uh, uh, um, so, you know, intergenerationally, uh, I think what we're saying is that we really think that creativity is something that we can all have access to in our lives in very simple ways. So when I was talking about contemplative dance practice, for example, is uh, a, a kind of way of just being in touch with your body and with your feelings and with your breath and with movement and with the environment. These are things we can all practice for ourselves. And I think we need inspiration from others for sure and some guidance 
but there's so much, as Tanya was saying, there's so much out there and in the pandemic era, there's so much online. Uh, yeah. You don't have to do these yeah. things online, right? You can go in nature, you can go, you know, outside, you can, uh, uh, with social distancing, you can maybe even, you know, connect with others. But of course, being safe uh, today is very important. So there's ways in which we're adapting, you know, to possibilities, but you know, it's always been something that people have done across cultures. Creativity is something that's always been part of people's ways of connecting with each other and trying to understand why we are here, uh, what is life about, you know, it's quite a, an important thing to do. I think we can't just leave it up to artists to do it for us. We all have to be engaged. And that's how, you know, we can become healthier and more balanced uh, and, and less anxious. And, you know, so we take it upon ourselves to be responsible for our own creative potential. I think that's one of the messages we want to send out today. Well, that seems like a wonderful message to end on, uh, a really positive one and a really important one. Um, and I see our time is up. It's gone by really fast. This has been really fabulous. There's been lots of comments in the chat box. And uh, we have even one from Fabian that I might read out to end our session. Thank you for all your hard work. My hat's off. One of my hats is being a parent. My children in school are facing a new challenge related to COVID. Many of the traditional gatherings that used to take place at school have disappeared. It's challenging to keep connectedness. I love to further explore the collective actions that could help our school committees to stay alive and keep that collective well-being on top of individual well-being in times of isolation. Ideally, these actions should connect through nature, leaving signs in place that remind us we are a community and uh, that we belong. And that's also a lovely way to end this session as well from one of our uh, participants. So I wanna conclude by thanking everyone who joined us today um, and particularly our panel um, and, um, and for you, for your sharing your work and uh, Liz for keeping things going so smoothly. Um, Thank you very, very much. We do very much look forward to hearing updates in the future. And so we're going to stay in touch and hopefully we can have another one of these in the coming months to hear more about your work. So thank you once again and thanks everyone for joining us. Have a great day. Bye-bye. <laughs>